Hi everyone, my name is Colby Beck. I am a Power Platform Solution Architect here at Journey Team. Today's video, I'm gonna be talking about how to govern the Power Platform and the six items that you need to be aware of when you start to deploy the Power Platform to your organization. Now this is a topic I talk about almost every day with um, clients and customers. Everyone's really worried about like how do we control this platform? It's, it's a very powerful platform, it's in the name. People can build flows, they can build apps. There's all these different things that they can do, but how do we control it. The nice thing is, is there are six items you need to consider to keep top of mind, or at least at a minimum, just have knowledge of these key terms to know. So when you start rolling out the Power Platform, you can start implementing a lot of these practices. The Power Platform is very forgiving. You can always implement these things later. You can implement them right now and really lock things down, but you can always kind of change your mind. And it's it's a very fluid platform and you're never really locked into any of, the, any of these decisions. So it's a really nice place where you can really figure things out as you go and as your organization continues to grow and develop, you can continue to change your policies to match um, the growth. So let's dive in. All right, governance time. So Power Platform governance. Like I said, there are six different things you need to be um, aware of. And the first item that you need to think about is how are you rolling it out? Who are your developers going to be? Are you going to be having citizen developers all across your organization who are going to be building flows and apps, just kind of doing whatever the heck they want? Or are you going to have a more centralized approach where you have an IT team who they're building all the apps and flows and they're handling requests, they're pushing things up through a dev, test, and prod lanes? These are all things you need to consider. Now, you don't have to do one or the other. You can do a mix of the two. You can change your mind as your journey continues to go down the Power Platform uh, path. Um, but you need to kind of have a good idea of how your organization wants to do this because depending on how or which path you go down, it's it's going to really determine a lot of decisions that you will need to make and paths you're going to need, need to go down from a governance um, perspective. So when you're trying to decide like, okay, if we want to have citizen developers, what type of app should they build? Really the way you need to look at these apps or these processes that they're working on is uh, one, the app complexity or process complexity coupled with the business criticality of that that uh, app or process. Now obviously the more complex or critical an app or process becomes, you should probably take that out of a citizen developer's hands and into the IT or some more trained up uh, developers to really make sure that it goes through the correct testing and building and that um, everything is good there. But if people are building simple apps that's maybe for like three to five people just in their org or they're building flows that really just, I don't know, if they get an email, it sends them a text message or some some small innocuous process like that, then having your uh, citizen developers do those things probably isn't that big of a deal. But we do want to make sure that if we are using citizen developers, that the data connectors that they're using fall with inside your company's uh, policy. The second item that you need to be aware of is there is an existing Power Platform admin center that is ready to go out of the box, as well as a center of excellence, or what is called the center of excellence. All the center of excellence is, is a bunch of solutions or, or folders that you can download from Microsoft. There's a lot of steps online to show you how to install those, and that'll help you kind of govern a little bit more of the nitty gritty of kind of what's going on with inside your Power Platform. Now I'm gonna show you uh, quickly both of these, um, just to kind of give you, a, give you a good taste of what you'll see once you get inside of both of these. Okay, so to get to the admin center, you can either first just type in admin.powerplatform.microsoft.com and that, that'll redirect you there and then you can log in. Or if you're already inside the maker portal, so make.powerapps.com, over here on the left it says Power Platform. If, if you select that, you'll see that you have the admin center right here, and that will open up this URL right here. So let's go over here to the admin center. First thing I wanna sh showcase here is when you're inside the Power Platform Admin Center, depending on your role, if you are a Power Platform System Admin, you will be able to see all environments inside your tenant. Um, and then, but if, but if you're not that, then you're only gonna be seeing environments that are actually shared with you or that you have access to. You can see here in Journey Team, we have um, a lot of different environments all used for different purposes. Now, I'm just gonna briefly go through a lot of these items over here uh, on the left, but you have high level analytics. So if we go over here to Dataverse, and I'm gonna actually change the filters to say, hey, you know what, actually let's kind of see what is going on in our production environment from these dates. And so we can see 
through uh, 620 and 621. So the last two days, we can kind of see that we've had 33 active users. We can see all our API calls. We can see that everything is passing correctly. So that, that makes us feel nice. We can also see who are the most active users in the system. Now the same goes for your Power Automate. And here you can see uh, for the last 30 days or 28 days, you can see all the different flow runs and how many have taken place daily as well as weekly. And the same thing goes for uh, Power Apps. You can see all that. You can check out your licensing through here. This gives, the licensing gives you kind of like a high level stuff. I, I don't think it's like the best yet. Sometimes it doesn't feel super accurate, but it gives you a good idea of kind of what's going on. And then also from the, the admin center, this is where we can set up our data policies, which I'll be talking about a little bit later. So the admin center is ready to go out of the box, it gives you a ton of information, but oftentimes people want a little bit more. And that is why there's what is called the center of excellence. Now you can go find the, the center of excellence if you go to learn.microsoft.com um, or if you just search Power Pl or center of excellence uh, setup, you'll find this URL in this, this uh, documentation here and you can actually walk through these steps. The nice thing is, is Microsoft has documented all the steps that it takes to install the center of excellence and get it going inside your environment or inside your tenant. And they also continue to update it and release new features with it. And so it's it's a really powerful thing. There are a lot of different features as part of it, so I'm not gonna talk about all of them, but let me just quickly show you the coolest one. So I'm gonna go back to make.powerapps.com. You'll notice over here, I have uh, where it says Environment Center of Excellence. If I click this, this is what lets you change environments from within the Maker Portal, but we have an environment called Center of Excellence. Uh, when you install the Center of Excellence, you can choose whatever name you want for that environment. It makes sense to call it Center of Excellence because that's what it is. But this is where all the apps and flows that are going to be looking into all the environments across your tenant, they're all gonna live. Now there, there's one specific app I'm gonna showcase. So this is the Power Platform Admin View. This is the app that lets you dive into your, your apps, your flows, your environments, your connectors, bots, and so forth to actually see who is building and where are they building. So the cool thing is, is over here on the left, so this is, like I said, all this, once you install it, this is all good, ready to go out of the box. But we can see that here at Journey Team, here are our top makers. You can see my name right here. I've built, looks like uh, 26 apps. Then over here, you can see th these little bars of how many apps and flows are actually inside your different environments. And then over here on the right, same thing with flows. And then you can scroll down, you have like a little bit more um, nitty gritty view. Now you can do a deep dive into all these different things, but even just at a high level, like for an, for an organization that if you're concerned about, hey, people have built all these apps and flows and we don't know what environments, there's just so much going on. Once you install the center of excellence, which usually takes between four to eight hours, depending on the skill level of the person installing it, like if they've worked with uh, power apps and solutions before, um, but as soon as they install it, you, have, you can have an admin get into this, this app instantly and they can see exactly what is going, to, going on across all their environments. So this is a really powerful tool and it's something that I recommend everyone install. This is obviously something that during team we can help you install, but the nice thing is, is you don't have to have us um, there staring over your shoulder because the steps are all um, lined out and documented very well by Microsoft um, if you go to this URL here. All right, the third item that you need to consider when you're trying to decide how you're gonna govern and roll out the Power Platform is what is your environment strategy? How do you wanna use environments? Now, all environment is, is it's a siloed place where apps, flows, and data can live. And from environment to environment, they're, they're very much separated. You can pass things back and forth if you wanna get all technical and tricky about things, but the majority of the time is they are very separate and they are their own their own environments. Now, the nice thing is, is Microsoft has some general guidance about how they recommend using environments. They, they look at it first as number of users and then the nature of the data and then how, what's the impact to the organization or if it requires the uh, life cycle management, application life cycle management, meaning are you gonna be pushing applications through your dev, test and production lanes? So this is a really nice way to kind of put some hard numbers around like if you have one to 10 users, then they can feel free to build in the default environment. And then up from there, you can go to share, dedicated, um, and all of that. The way that I like to look at it is really what data or apps need to live in this environment and who needs to access 
the data in apps. If you have apps related to sales, there's a good chance that marketing also needs access to that data. So it would make sense for some businesses to have all of their sales and marketing apps all inside that environment. Now, we always recommend doing a dev test and prod or at a minimum, at least a dev in production for applications that are a little bit more critical to business. Every time you go to the Power Platform, so anyone in your organization right now, if they were to go to make.powerapps.com, they're, they're gonna land in the default environment. What that means is they have access to the default environment. Now, depending on um, licensing and what controls you put into place, they can really start just building apps and flows how they want, which is why we say don't put critical apps inside the default environment. We, we need to put all apps and data into their own environments so that they're protected. I like to look at the default environment as a playground. It's a good place where people can go kind of dip their toes in the water a little bit and start building some simple flows and some apps just to kind of see how things working, maybe build a few apps just to kind of help their little, their team. Where, where possible and where necessary, always use dev, test, and prod, or like I said, at a minimum, dev and prod, and then treat the default environment as a playground where people can kind of just mess around, but it shouldn't, the default environment should not contain any sensitive data or production level applications. The next item to consider are data loss prevention policies or DLPs. Now these are super powerful. They are gonna help you lock down your environments to make sure that if someone's building an app or a flow, they can only connect to data or connectors that are allowed. You set up your DLPs inside the admin center and when you go through the setup process, it's a very straightforward process, but really all you're, you're doing is you are moving connectors from non-business to business or to blocked. So you have the three different swim lanes and essentially what you're able to do is say, you know what, if someone's gonna build an app that is connecting to the Dataverse, in this case, they can't connect to anything else. And then you can even go as far as saying, if someone wants to build a flow, they can't use any custom connectors. So they can't call any custom API calls or send data to some random third party, not allowed. By default, all connectors are just in the non-business. So out of the box right now, if someone was to go to the, your, your default environment and you didn't have DLP in, in place, they could build an app, they could connect to SQL Server, they could connect to uh, Salesforce, they could connect to, I don't know, Twitter, whatever they wanted, they can start sending data however the heck they want. That's how it stands kind of out of the box. So the best policy for you to, to take is to get into your admin center and then just go create a basic data loss prevention policy that you can apply to at a minimum your default environment that says, hey, if people are gonna be building in the default environment, we only want them to connect to, I don't know, Outlook and Dataverse or whatever it is. So go make sure you ha have a data policy in place. Um, the nice thing is, is you can always change these if, if you need to in the future. So you're not set in stone with any of these decisions that you can roll things back. And the other cool thing about these is if your organization is already using Power Apps and Power Automate heavily, but you don't have DLP in place, but you also don't know what kind of data connectors people are using, you can put in a DLP and it'll instantly shut down those apps and flows that are, that are breaking your policy and they'll get a little message saying, hey, sorry, this app or flow doesn't meet the, the policy standards, and then they'll have to reach out to you, and they can either go through a special request to say, hey, I do need to connect to SQL and the Dataverse at the same time, and that's where you can kind of decide, do we need to make an environment specifically for that just to make sure that it's very protected and safe, or is it an innocuous thing, and sure, they can connect to like whatever connectors they need. Okay, the next item to consider is your security model, i.e. how are people getting allowed into the Power Platform and what do they have access to do? The way that we like to streamline security is we always like to start with security groups, whether you're using enter groups or uh, 365 groups. Both these groups will work. So what you do is you create those groups up there in Entra or 365. Then inside your specific environments, you create a team that essentially syncs from one of those groups. And then that team is where you assign your Canvas apps, your security roles, your model driven apps, give them access to Dataverse tables. So everything you can start to manage at more like a higher level instead of going into each one of your users and saying, hey, I'm gonna share this Canvas app with you or and give you this security role. Now, obviously, if you have an environment where you only have a few users, it might not be that big of a deal just to be sharing Canvas apps directly or assigning security roles directly because it's pretty minimal. But as soon as you have over 10 users or 20 users, 100 users, that can get like really tedious. And so by simply putting them in a security group, and having it sync down into your specific environment, 
you can automate the sharing process of everything, which is super nice. So that can really simplify things. And it's just, it's just easier to maintain moving forward. Now, the last item to consider is everyone's favorite topic, and that is licensing. I do have a video specifically about Power Apps licensing that goes into the, the details, but I'm gonna cover it uh, very brief, briefly right here. When it comes to licensing, and right now I'm just talking about Power Apps license, licenses, and the reason why is because if you have Power Apps licenses for your users, they already have access to Power Automate. So this is kind of like the, uh, the one license to rule them all. With Power Apps licenses, the first question you have to ask yourself is, are my data connectors or data sources that this app or flow is going to connect to, is it a premium or standard? Now, if you don't know if it's premium or standard, I like to think of it this way. If it's useful, it's probably premium. If it's not that useful, it's probably standard. Now, there are some caveats there. SharePoint is a standard connector. Now, if someone's using SharePoint as a relational database, I call foul, I think that is wrong. You should be using the Dataverse or SQL for anything relational. So if you are using a, if you're using standard connectors, so like I said, SharePoint's an example, Excel Online, Outlook, essentially everything in like the Microsoft suite or the Office suite, those are covered in your E3 and E5 licenses. So if you already have E3 and E5 licenses and, and you look at the, the details in that licensing, it says, hey, you have access to Power Apps, but only if they're using standard connectors. So they can build apps off a SharePoint list or whatever they need. But as soon as you get over to the premium connectors, or as I like to say, a useful connector, now you need to start paying for a premium license. Now, all the Power Apps licenses are premium. The only difference between these three different apps, or excuse me, licenses, is how many apps can the user access. So if your user needs to use four or more licenses, then you're, you're gonna wanna purchase them a $20 license, the premium uh, Power App premium license, because that, that'll give them access to unlimited apps. But if they only need to access one to four, applications, then you can get away using the Power App per app license because that license gets them access to one app and you can stack those onto an ind individual. Now, like I said, I do have a video go goes a little bit more into detail as far as like how do you assign these licenses. We're not going to cover that in this video, so go check that out. Okay, so just to recap, the six items that you need to consider when rolling out the Power App platform is first you need to make sure that you know how you're gonna roll this thing out. Are you gonna have citizen developers? Is it gonna be more IT governed, centralized? Are you gonna have a mix of the two? You really need to figure out how you're gonna move forward with that. Then you need to familiarize yourself with the admin center and you should, if possible, install the center of excellence. It doesn't take, like I said, it doesn't take too long, but it will help give you the really nitty gritty insight as to exactly what is being built. Third, you need to make sure you have an environment strategy are you gonna be having, everyone gets their own environment where they can build, you're gonna be using dev test and production environments, how environments are gonna, how are they gonna be sharing data? You really need to figure out how you can move forward with that. Then you need to make sure you inst you create data loss prevention policies on top of those environments to make sure that what people are building in there it stays within the confines of your, your policy. And then get your security model built out and automated, that way you don't have to always be in the weeds of figuring out who has what security role, Just, use security groups and have everything automated. And then the last, and like I said, the most fun topic is get your licensing figured out. There are a lot of ways where you can really lower your licensing costs by using some of the, the cheaper app license, license, licenses, um, but it's just something that you kind of have to work through on a case by case basis. Like I said, my name is Colby Beck. Feel free to reach out to me or anyone here at Journey Team if you have any further questions and we'll see you next time. Thank you.